Thank you for joining us for this special occasion. My name is Dan Mordarski. I'm a proud graduate of Bowling Green State University, and I'm privileged to serve as the chair of the board of directors for the BGSU Alumni Association. Tonight's Academy of Distinguished Alumni honorees join a special circle of BGSU alumni who have been recognized for similar ideals of leadership, service, and accomplishments. The Academy of Distinguished Alumni evolved from the Alumni Association's previous annual recognition programs. In the past, we have honored our alumni and celebrated their successes through the Accomplished Graduate Award, Alumni Service Award, Alumni Community Award, and Recent Graduate Award. Five years ago, we began a new era in recognizing our dedicated and determined alumni with the Academy of Distinguished Alumni. Similar to our motto of once a falcon, always a falcon, we say the same thing about our award winners. Once an alumni award winner, always an alumni award winner. I would like to acknowledge our past award winners. Please stand when I call your name and accept our congratulations once again. Alicia Fernandez Mott, Academy of Distinguished Alumni. Linda Forte, Academy of Distinguished Alumni. Ed Reiter, Academy of Distinguished Alumni. Paul Stifler, Academy of Distinguished Alumni. Dr. Ralph Hagen Haven Wolf, Distinguished Alumni Award. And Betty Montgomery, Distinguished Alumnus Award. This evening, we are also honored to welcome a number of the BGSU Prominent 100 who were honored during the university's centennial celebration for their extraordinary accomplishments and achievements. Please stand when I call your name to accept our congratulations. Jim Bailey. <laughs> Betty Montgomery. Ed Ryder, and Willie Young. We are very appreciative of the relationships all of you have maintained with Bowling Green State University. Despite rigorous commitments of your careers, your families, and your communities, you always seem to make time for Bowling Green, and we appreciate that. The Academy is yet another link between our alumni and our students. We hold up these shining examples of what it means to be an alum of BGSU and allowing our students to see that there are no limits of what they can do with a BGSU degree. So before we officially induct our 2016 honorees, I am pleased to welcome President Mary Ellen Maisie. Thank you, Dan, and welcome to this wonderful evening of all of our Falcons coming home and their guests. Isn't it just great to be a Falcon tonight? Isn't it just great? <clears throat> you know, this is my sixth year at BGSU, and I often say it's such a, a special place. And it's a special place because of all the Falcons and their dedication to Bowling Green State University. And I'm so very, very proud of all the accomplishments that BGSU has received over the last 100 years, and especially over the last five years that a great team here has put together. You know, we're known as a campus of innovation, collaboration, and transformation. And we've accomplished that in terms of our national rankings, 
U.S. News and World Report says we're right there at the top 100 public institutions in the country. And The Economist magazine that did a ranking last year said we were number one of the public universities in the state. And just yesterday, just yesterday, one of our board, former board chairs, John Moore, called me at 9 a.m. in the morning, and he said, you know what? BGSU is in the Wall Street Journal today, ranked as the number one right there public university with Auburn, Michigan State, and Miami University for student engagement. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> number one, right there at the top. We're so very proud. We're so very proud. And we're so very proud of our numbers. And it, you know, this is the third year in a row we admitted the best academically prepared class in the university's history. And it was also the largest best prepared class in the university's history. We're almost right there at 20,000 headcount in terms of our students. And it's because of the quality and value of the BGSU degree. And all you have to do is look at this room and look at round and see that quality and value of the BGSU degree and how far it will take you. So, you know, tonight we're going to celebrate. We've got 16 great individuals, many of them in the room here tonight, that have been inducted into the Academy of Distinguished Alums and four more tonight. So congratulations to Katherine Hatton. Congratulations to Mike McGuire. Congratulations to Ray Mullins, and congratulations to John Prout. And I must say, I feel honored and privileged to have know each and every one of you and have had lunch or dinner with each and every one of you. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us tonight, and it's on with the show. Thank you. Thank you, President Maisie. We are now at the point in the evening where we get to pay tribute to our honorees. Our first honoree this evening is Catherine Hatton. Catherine Hatton is Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a $10 billion national foundation working to build a culture of health in the United States. She also serves as a member of the foundation's Senior Management Committee, Previously, she was Vice President and General Counsel of Philadelphia Newspapers, publisher of the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Philadelphia Daily News, and Philly.com. She was a shareholder in the Philadelphia law firm, now known as Cone, Swift, and Graff. Courage, advocacy, leadership. Katherine Hatton. Catherine is bar none the most respected general counsel in philanthropy. She's just an absolute supporter and defender of the First Amendment. I think she would be just a wonderful example of what you can achieve in your career. I got to know Catherine Hatton very early on in my uh, tenure here as president and CEO, because one of the first positions I needed to recruit was a general counsel. So the general counsel is the top lawyer in the corporation or at a nonprofit. They're responsible for supervising the legal department, for engaging outside counsel, for dealing with all legal issues that would come up to the corporation or to the foundation. And as I started to talk to people about who might be good, at different institutions. It was like the Roman Empire. All roads led to Catherine Hatton. Her career path has been very interesting. I mean, she went from being a journalist to being a lawyer for journalists. She was the lawyer that would be brought in to review stories if there were potential legal issues looming. And I always felt so good when Catherine would get finished reviewing it, because I figured if, if the story passed muster with her, that I was probably going to be OK. Catherine Hatton's career has been one that really had 
kind of three distinct phases. She practiced law in a law firm. Um, she was a general counsel at a major newspaper in the Philadelphia area. And now she's been the general counsel at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the largest philanthropy uh, in America that is devoted solely to health. What we're trying to do is to help everyone in America lead a healthier life. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is a fantastic place. It really does a lot of great work in trying to uh, use money wisely to promote good health and good eating. Catherine is the kind of person that is incredibly influential in her field. She is someone that makes an impression on people and she makes an effort to stay connected to them and therefore she's uh, very influential in the legal field. You know, I feel very privileged to call her my dear friend because I think to have someone who has such a great sense of fun and a passion for everything that she does, and I think that's really unique in a woman who has really reached the pinnacle of her profession. And she's achieved that because of the way she approaches what she does. She has curiosity. If there's a problem, there's no one who's going to research it with more precision and comprehensiveness than Catherine. And I think what I admire the most about Catherine is that she brings out the best in you and she instills in you a desire to do more and to be better uh, at what you do. She's got a great zeal for life and it, it, it really is infectious. And then finally, and this is probably the secret sauce, Catherine cares deeply about people. She cares about people, and those things come through in all of her work, and I think that's why she's so influential. She is somebody who is a firm believer in paying it forward and ensuring that younger women who will follow in her footsteps will have the opportunities to overcome challenges that we all face in our careers and to succeed. You can do great things by focusing on what really matters in people's lives, because I think that's what Katherine Hatton has done her whole career. She just has all of the great qualities of a, of a true leader, and her career would be a great example of what you can do with your life. Congratulations, Catherine. Would you please join Dr. Maisie on stage to receive your award? I'm standing here tonight knowing I am way out of my league. So first, my congratulations to the other honorees. I've read all about your achievements, and they are phenomenal. I'm not in your league, but I am thrilled to be here. I only wish my mom and dad were here to see this. Each of them died too young. They missed way too many family milestones. My dad, I should point out, wanted me to go to Ohio State. <laughs> he was an OSU grad, and he desperately wanted one of the Hatton kids to follow in his footsteps to an OSU degree. My older sister, Carol, started at OSU, but she transferred schools to be closer to her high school sweetheart, Ken, and she never looked back. They've now been married for 52 years, and I'm happy they're here tonight. I was the fourth of five kids, so a lot was riding on me. But I simply wasn't interested in Ohio State. Thankfully, my little sister ultimately fulfilled my dad's dream. 
Bowling Green was my first and only college choice. Why? Because it promised a quality education, a location far enough, but not too far away from home, and the opportunity to explore subjects and extracurricular activities that might help me identify a life path. It worked. Classes in the BG News made me a journalist. Then newspapering in Cleveland at the Plain Dealer introduced me to the most important choice of my life, my life partner, my husband Richard Bellotti. We've been married for 36 years. Newspapering led me to lawyering. Lawyering took me back to journalism as a newspaper lawyer, and then to my current position at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where, as you've heard, we're working to build a culture of health. That means creating a society that gives every person in this country the opportunity to, to live the healthiest life they can, no matter what their ethnicity or race, no matter where they live, no matter how much they earn, or what their physical or mental challenges might happen to be. The thread that holds all of these life choices together is something I learned here at BGSU. It's important to challenge yourself to do good work and to spend your time with bright people who want to change the world. I wanted to change the world when I was editor of the BG News. We expressed a lot of strong opinions, many of which my parents found objectionable. It was, after all, the 70s. Uh, eventually, I had to eliminate their subscription to the newspaper. Uh, it was easier that way when I went home. Bowling Green taught me about myself. It taught me I could challenge conventional thinking, I could think critically, I could marshal facts, construct reasoned arguments, and express myself clearly without rancor. These are life skills. They've served me well. This university pushed me, and it stretched me. BGSU taught me to reach higher, to see the bigger picture, and for that, I will always be grateful. These lessons have a new resonance today. We live in a society that seems more divided and acrimonious than ever, fractured along lines of race, ethnicity, income, and political beliefs. And many wonder if universities have the capability to prepare students to confront difficult, complicated societal issues. BGSU can do this. It is doing this. It can help students to value others even when they disagree, to treat people with respect and dignity, to listen, and to appreciate and learn from the backgrounds and experiences of all the people who comprise this amazing university community. As Justice, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor said years ago when she was describing her own university experience, a university can be a place where students learn to build bridges, not walls. Thank you, Bowling Green, for teaching me the importance of bridges. Congratulations, Catherine. You have accomplished a lot, and you're really a true inspira inspiration to many, so thank you. Our next recipient is Mike McGuire. Mike McGuire is the Chief Executive Officer of Grant Thornton. Grant Thornton is the U.S. member firm of Grant Thornton International, one of the world's leading networks of independent audit, tax, and advisory firms. Prior to his election as CEO, he served as National Managing Partner of Operations. He also chairs the Grant Thornton Foundation and serves on the GTIL Global Board. Prior to joining the firm, he spent 20 years with Arthur Anderson. Drive. Dedication. Innovation. Mike McGuire. You can't know Mike McGuire and not smile. When he walks into a room, Mike McGuire has a presence. He is 
well, well known in this city and very much appreciated for all that he has given to the city. I don't think Charlotte would be the city that it is without Mike McGuire. I was uh, fortunate to know Mike when he first started in his career with uh, Arthur Anderson in the Charlotte office. He rose through the ranks uh, of Arthur Anderson uh, quickly, became an audit partner, and then uh, became a management leader within the firm. Mike was always bubbling with optimism, which quite honestly I think is one of the biggest strengths uh, in, in how he's got to where he is in his career today. 2002, uh, Arthur Anderson was in the process of going out of business and Mike led an effort in the Carolinas to secure a transaction with Grant Thornton. Grant Thornton asked if he would come over and work for them and he said I'll, I'll do it but I have to bring the entire office with me. Everyone all the way from the most senior partner to the people in the mailroom, the administrative assistants, all landed on their feet, all got jobs. We went home on Friday as Arthur Anderson and came in on Monday with Grant Thornton on the wall. When he took over the office here, he grew that to be the largest and most successful office within Grant Thornton. Then we, the partnership board, tapped him for the CEO role a couple years ago and he's doing just a fantastic job. He's incredibly creative. He wakes up every day with new ideas. McGuire's an innovator. McGuire thinks out on the edge of things. He wants to take us to an entire new level, not to just to be effective and compete, but to be the best. And in the last few years since he's been CEO, I mean, the firm has advanced tremendously. We have grown by a factor of five, so we're five times larger today, uh, firm-wide, than Grant Thornton was in 2002 when uh, might join the firm. And I always uh, appreciate people more who've gone through the tough times and, and rebounded even stronger. And that's exactly what he did. He has given so much to the Carolinas community, the Charlotte community specifically over the years. He's been involved in some of the most uh, you know, high profile boards in the community. He and his wife as well, both of them have a passion for community service. And Mike, you know, everything he does, he's all in. And that's one of the things that really sets set Mike apart was the depth and quality of what he brought. Huge commitment of time and energy. He's very proud of this community. He wants it to be as great as it can be. Mike McGuire, through his work, has caused a very positive economic impact in the recruitment of literally hundreds of thousands of jobs to the state of North Carolina and especially to Charlotte because he was new and he could tell outside businesses that were looking to come to North Carolina that this is a great place to live, work, and raise a family. He's a kind soul. I mean, truly, a genuinely kind soul. And he enjoys helping people and it's, it comes across very sincerely. With Mike, every human being deserves equal dignity and respect and he treats everyone that way. To me, that's the strongest trait of an individual, someone who gives because it comes from the heart, not because uh, he is seeking attention or rewards or recognition. Here is a guy that I felt like ought to get more accolades and will never seek the limelight. Again, a servant leader. I can't imagine there's many more deserving candidates for a distinguished uh, alumni award th than Mike. I'm certainly proud of him as a, a, a lifelong friend of his, and I think Bowling Green should be very proud as well. Mike, congratulations. Please join Dr. Maisie on stage to receive your award. Good evening, everybody, and, and thank you, President Maisie and, and the trustees and the faculty and, and the students that are here tonight. I know uh, I was talking to Ray Braun and, and noticed all of the business students here, so welcome. You know, one of the things about Bowling Green that I learned is re about relationships. I was raised to be a relationship person. Uh, I think I am probably people's exhibit number one, <laughs> right straight out of uh, central casting for a Bowling Green graduate. 
I grew up in a small town about 50 miles from here, uh, West Unity, real little small town in Williams County. I grew up in a town of about 1,600 people where my parents uh, owned a grocery store. And uh, I worked there, and when my dad bought the store, uh, I was 10 years old, my younger brother was nine, and, and my older brother was 11. So, you know, he, uh, he paid us a quarter an hour uh, and thinks that he lost money because he also fed us for that. Uh, I, uh, I, t I always tell him today uh, that, I, that I, I said, Dad, you know, at some point, you know, we were hoping that you would, you would pay us what we, what we were worth, uh, more than a quarter an hour. And he said, yes, I, I thought about that a lot, talked about that with your mother a lot, but I figured I had to pay you something. So, <laughs> but you know, I learned a lot, uh, and the lessons I learned are really at the corner of, of Jackson and Main Street. I know this uh, is going to, is being streamed to my parents uh, who are watching. Hopefully uh, my sister got it up on their computer, but uh, hi, mom and dad. Uh, I love you very much, and I'm dedicating this award to you because I, I wouldn't be here without all of, all of the guidance and support that you've given me over the years. You know, growing up in a grocery store like that really taught me a lot. Uh, and I watched my dad build relationships. And throughout my life, I, I always cherish long-term relationships, the relationship I have with the university. I look at my table over here, and I have uh, Kevin over here, Kevin Roop. Kevin was my first roommate here at Bowling Green. Uh, we, he and I have been friends for a long time from, from high school, and uh, so he, he's here with me. And then uh, Steve Baird, right next to him. Steve met on the first day uh, of, uh, at Cole Hall when I started at Bowling Green. So, so they've been friends for a long time. And then I have Kevin Zins over here, one of my partners, uh, Grant Thornton from Cincinnati. He's also a Bowling Green graduate, accounting major, and uh, I asked him if he would come. And of course, my wife, Melissa, who's been with me and my foundation for, uh, for 30 years. I think it's important that when you go through life, you have long-term relationships. As I look up here on, on the screen uh, at the video, those are people that I've known for over 30 years. The guy that cuts my hair I've, has done it for 30 years. So I, I just believe in, in long-term uh, relationships. Ray Braun, our dean of the business school, Ray and I were RAs. Uh, I was in Cole Hall. He was in Rogers. Uh, he worked twice as hard as I did <laughs> because he was in Rogers. But, you know, we grew, we grew up and... Um, and we were in student government together, and then one day in Charlotte, I picked up, he went, he went to law school, and I went to, to uh, Charlotte. One day I picked up the business journal, and there's Ray. He was moving to Charlotte. And so Ray and Teresa, we reconnected uh, in Charlotte and, and have, have, been friends, uh, have been friends ever since. So I think it's, it's one of those things that I learned at the university I also learned about caring for people and really taking an interest in coaching and mentoring. And I learned that from, from the, the, the faculty that I had here at the university. Um, when I was growing up in West Unity, I did not know what an accountant was. I mean, I didn't know what a big eight accounting firm was. I never had exposure to it. My dad used to always tell me, he said, you know, Mike, you ought to be, you're, you know, you're good in math, you ought to be, uh, maybe you ought to think about being an accountant. The only accountant I ever knew was a woman named Betty Ricks. And Betty did the bookkeeping for my dad's, uh, my dad's business. Um, she uh, she kind of had a, a, a well-worn car. Uh, let's say it was fully depreciated if you're an accounting major. Uh, and, you know, she just wasn't a picture of health. And, uh, and really wasn't a picture of happiness. I mean, she worked all the time, and I kept thinking to my dad, you know, Dad, I appreciate you looking out for me, but why do you want me to, to have a job like Betty Ricks? I mean, I want to have some fun. So I, I came to Bowling Green uh, and with, with Kevin, and uh, I was going to be a, a, a pre-law, business pre-law major. And so I, I ended up going, uh, got to know uh, Steve, and one time he told me his, uh, his brother, Kim, uh, was going to come through town and, and wanted to, to, to see us or take us to dinner or something. And, 
And uh, here comes Kim, and he was dressed nicely and a really nice guy. And, and uh, I was really impressed with, with his, his older brother, Kim. And I said, what does your brother do? He's an accountant. He works for a big eight accounting firm called Pete Marwick and Mitchell in Cincinnati. And I'm sitting there the whole time, and I mean, I, I didn't even pay attention to what Steve was saying. I'm thinking, Kim Baird, Betty Ricks. Kim Baird, <laughs> Betty Ricks. I was trying to figure out a reconcile in my mind. Needless to say, I was so impressed there that I, I was so impressed with, with uh, Kim. And of course, Steve was an accounting major that I literally changed my major to accounting. And uh, so I, I want to invite Steve here because he actually is the reason that I, that I went, uh, went into accounting. But as I got into the accounting program, the, the, uh, the professors I had really uh, took an interest uh, in me, and uh, especially uh, Park Leathers. Dr. Leathers was the chair of the accounting department. He worked for, uh, Art, he had worked earlier in his career for Arthur Anderson, and he was an innovator. Uh, he, he, he started with internships, and back in the time when internships, I mean, few people had internships, but I, he just made, uh, he, he, was, he was encouraging to me, and, uh, and I, had, uh, I had an internship, and it really changed my life and got me ahead. Uh, so when I decided, when I was graduating, um, he, was, uh, he was such an influence on me that I, so I picked uh, Arthur Anderson as a firm that I wanted to go with, and so I ended up moving down to uh, to Charlotte. And the the back or, or the, the 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 education that I received at Bowling Green uh, and the experience I got actually put me ahead of everybody. I mean, most of the people in Charlotte at the time they thought, "Where in Kentucky is Bowling Green?" And uh, and so I mean, I really didn't have. And I'm going all the, everybody in there was, was uh, you know, they were going to, uh, uh, had gone to NC State, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Wake Forest, and other places. They didn't know where we, where we were and where I was coming from. But, uh, but the education and the internship that I got got me off to a very fast track. And uh, I got promoted uh, in, in one year. Uh, and, and it, I was, became a manager in four years, and it was really the education the experience that I got at the university that, that helped me out. And I'll never forget that, but I look back at it and the, the attachment that I have to the university. Today, uh, I, I had uh, the good fortune to uh, go to Larry Kowalski's uh, tax class, a master's in tax class. Uh, Larry's teaching still, and uh, and he looks the same, actually. It's really kind of interesting. I think I changed more than, than what Larry did. And I told Steve uh, that I was, I was speaking in Larry's class, and he said, yeah, he was pretty tough. So, uh, but he was very good and, and taught me a lot. In fact, when I started, uh, I started in the audit practice, but after the end of audit busy season, I was able to go in and work, do some work in the tax department, which really helped me. And the only reason I was able to do that was I had a better tax education at Bowling Green than anyone who had started with me. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a great experience for me uh, being a graduate. I'm so proud of this university. Uh, I'm so proud of the relationships I've built. And I thank all of you for this award. It's, it's a tremendous honor for me. And uh, it, it means more to me than you'll ever know. So thank you for the honor and thank you for all you do. And for you students out there, just keep in mind, a Bowling Green education, with a Bowling Green education, you can achieve anything. And so good luck to all of you. Thank you. Congratulations, Mike, in being inducted into an impressive group for the Academy of Distinguished Alumni. Our next recipient this evening is Judge C. Ray Mullins. Judge Mullins was appointed to the bench in Atlanta in 2000, becoming the first African-American bankruptcy judge in the 11th Circuit, which consists of all federal districts in Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. In 2012, excuse me, he became the chief judge of the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Northern District of Georgia. In 2013, Chief Justice John Roberts of the U.S. Supreme Court appointed Mullins to a four-year term on the board of directors of the Federal Judicial Center, which provides training and re research for the federal judiciary. 
Judge Mullins has been married to his falcon flame, Beverly Mullins, for 40 years. Strength. Empathy. Mentoring. The Honorable Judge Ray Mullins. I think it's Maya Angelou who says that people might forget what you say, but they'll never forget how you make them feel. So Judge Mullins makes us feel better. He is just genuinely the personification of a hug. That's how he makes all of us feel. Ray has a work ethic uh, that exceeds anybody I've ever known, and, and I, he must get that from his parents. His mother worked uh, cleaning uh, doctor's offices, and his dad worked in the steel mills, and then at night he cleaned law offices. And he took little Ray when he was about 12 to help him clean the law offices, and Ray once told me he thought that's where he got his first interest in the law, just seeing these big books. Luckily, he had a mentor at Bowling Green who saw the incredible promise that Judge Mullins had. When I first noticed him, he was uh, sitting in front of uh, front row. He was uh, very attentive, and he also uh, wanted to improve himself. I don't give myself uh, the credit for that he would have made something out of himself. I would say in 30 years of teaching, definitely one of the very top students that I had. What really impressed me about Ray was his ability to manage, I'm going to put law school first, teaching his work, family, having a child. And I have to say, Ray had the most supportive, wonderful wife. And I think he'd be the first person to say that some of his success, maybe much of his success, is due to Bev. So the, the family plan was to work hard and to provide for, for young Derek, and then Ray Mullins found his way into bankruptcy, became associated with some of the most sophisticated bankruptcy cases that were going on in the nation, eventually moved uh, from Ohio to Atlanta, which was a hotbed for commercial litigation, and found a real niche there. And then a few years later, Ray came on our bench. He was appointed by the 11th Circuit in 2000. The 11th Circuit is comprised of Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. And up until 2000, we did not have an African-American bankruptcy judge. He was just a breath of fresh air. He brought a lot of energy and tremendous enthusiasm to the job and to the court. But it wasn't just our court for which he did a great deal and does a great deal. He has done so much for judicial education, and, and uh, this is a huge theme in his life, teaching. And in 2009, I believe it was, Chief Justice Roberts of the Supreme Court appointed Ray to be the chairman of the Bankruptcy uh, Education Committee of the Federal Judicial Center. He, in my opinion, is always giving back, always giving back. He is constantly mentoring, especially, especially young African-American children who show any kind of interest in the law. And his huge heart played a big role and has played a big role in his conduct of a courtroom. Because let's face it, most people, it's a really bad time in their life when they come to bankruptcy court. People often get into bankruptcy because of medical concerns or they lose a job. And, and he'll say to people, if your child needed surgery and you didn't have any money, but you had a credit card, what would you do? What would you do? And that, I think, comes from his sense of family, his sense of faith. I think that his parents really instilled in him the idea uh, that you do for others, that you do for others and you do as much as you can. In fact, each, each day before he goes out to the court, he looks at a picture of his parents and he looks at them and remembers how would you want me to treat the people who come before you? I would say his degree of empathy and compassion was not what you always find. Compassionate, 
humble, just human to the core. You know, when I think of Ray, I, it's funny, I smile. I can't imagine a better representation of what Bowling Green State University wants to be and wants their graduates to be. I think he's ideal. I'm just, I'm so grateful for what he does and how he does it. I'm grateful every day. He's a wonderful mentor for his colleagues. He's a wonderful model for me about how to, how to act and how to um, just conduct your life. So I'm very grateful that I know him. Congratulations, Judge Smolens. Please join Dr. Maisie on stage to accept your award. First, Madam President, thank you. I've been on the cloud since you came to Atlanta in the spring and told me about this. It's been pretty overwhelming. Um, and I've thought about what I would say uh, because no one stands with any level of success by themselves. So I thought, what could I express? And people that know me know that I take inspiration from music and different things. So. Uh, this one song popped into my head about this night, and I'd like to read two verses from this song I listen to all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now I know the destination is there if I want it. My eyes were slow to notice the master plan. Now I see, now I see the path if I can only stay on it. My history has made me the man I am. I learned to forgive. I learned to put the past behind me. I learned only love is worth remembering. The lives I have lived, the friends and loved ones on my journey, all of them feathers from an angel's wing. And so when I thought about the people of my life, they're angels from a feather's wing, I mean, feathers from an angel's wing. Um, when I got to Bowling Green in 70, uh, I was from a small town, Steubenville, Ohio. Didn't know a lawyer, didn't know any professionals. Said so, no, all the exposure was cleaning a law office from the time I was 12 all the way through college. Uh, the first feathers on, uh, from an angel's wing are my parents, Coleman and Carrie Mullins. Nothing that I ever have or will be uh, just all starts there. I could talk all night. They just, they were just everything to me. Neither one graduated high school, rural Alabama, seven kids, and uh, all value, all strength, all perseverance mm -hmm. comes from my mother and father. The next uh, mm -hmm. feathers from my angel wing is when I came to Bowling Green and uh, met a few gentlemen in a dorm. They're seated around and uh, pledged Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And uh, that was 1970 to 71. And they're seated at these two tables. Uh, we learned uh, discipline. We learned service, service to mankind, doing things for others. And that has always uh, been an inspiration. And they're all an inspiration to me. And uh, every one of them have done great things with their lives. Uh, the next uh, feather from Angel's Wing from Bowling Green is my wife, Beverly. She was Beverly Brown in 1973 when I first met her. And uh, needless to say, I fell hard, fast. <laughs> yeah, so uh, she was two years behind. And uh, as the video said, we in uh, August celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. Uh, uh, she was two years behind me here at Bowling Green. Uh, we got married, and our honeymoon was the MBA program. 
We got literally got married. I was working at General Electric in Louisville. We loaded up my little one bedroom apartment and we came to Bowling Green. And so, but the third feather in, in this uh, story is sitting right there. Chan K. Han. You saw him in a video and you said he didn't have much to do. He is not telling you the truth. Um, beside my father and my mother and the adults they put me around growing up until my father dropped me off in September of 70 at Bowling Green, the man that meant the most to me in getting me started on the right path and has been a friend and inspiration to me is Dr. Chan K. Han. He, <laughs> he was the first one to express. He actually came to me, and I think he, he gives it a little shine. He said I was real interested. A couple of days I was drifting off and sleeping, and he didn't tell you about that and how he cursed me out. I think he started in English and he lapsed into a language I didn't even understand. But <laughs> I had, had a major. He told me, your major's gonna be uh, management, and my major was management. When I graduated, Bev changed her management because I told her about Dr. Hart. She changed her major. So I go to Louisville, Kentucky to work for General Electric for two years on a management training program. So Bev would stay in touch with Dr. Hahn. He would always ask, how's Ray doing? She was saying, well, he really doesn't like what he's doing. So about the two-year mark, the program was up. And I really wasn't happy and didn't know what to do. Dr. Hahn, come back up, let's talk. So we talked. He said, why don't you come get a master's degree? You and Bev can go to grad school. Take some time, figure it out. Got my master's degree, still wasn't sure. They hired me to faculty. I taught in the management department from 1977 to 82. He wanted me to get a PhD and teach. He went to Ohio State, he wanted me to go to his alma mater. I had gone to Ohio State, I went to Toledo, and I was juggling law, PhD, law, PhD. Decided law, came back, told him, I thought, okay, this is my end of my teacher career. He tells me, if you want to stay and teach while you go to law school, you can stay. So I went to law school, I taught two years straight, and I started law school in 79, graduated in 82, arranged my schedule to take early morning classes, took a full schedule afternoon class at Toledo. The only reason I went up there was because they didn't have a law school here. But, uh, and, uh, and he was just so supportive, so supportive to Bev and me. And uh, literally, he gave me confidence. He gave me someone that actually cared about me. He used to tell me all the time, Ray, get your education because no matter what happens to you in your life, if you get it, it can't be taken away from you. And I always remember that. He told me that over and over. Dr. Hahn, I wouldn't be standing here for for you, man. Um, and. Uh, Everything else is just literally uh, people coming in and helping. My wife Beverly could be standing here instead of me. When she retired in December, she was executive director of human resources for Verizon Wireless. She had a territory that went from Tampa to Little Rock. She had over 100 direct reports, and she directed a force of over 11,000 people. Her senior management team would come, you go to her office and you see the picture of senior management team, it would be 20 men in Bev. Uh, extraordinary, I don't know how she did it, so Bev, this award is a co-award. You deserve it as much as I do. And so, uh, I could go on, but I just want to keep faith with the three to five minute level, but Bowling Green has been everything to me. It helped make me a man. It taught me responsibility. I found love here. I found respect. I found backing and uh, just wouldn't, wouldn't be here without it. And lastly, my son couldn't be here, who had just moved to the area from DC, he's practicing in Detroit. So the weather was horrible, he couldn't get here. But one of the big surprises I had is Burley Singleton, who's sitting there by my wife. Uh, even though I have one son, people in the office, when Burley calls, uh, my secretary said, your second son is on the line, 
and that's, he's my second son, so I'm just happy to see my second son who flew up from Atlanta, is going to take a 6 a.m. flight in the morning to come to do this, Burley, thanks a lot. I love you all, and uh, you all have been a great inspiration, and uh, those of you that are Bowling Green students, you're very, very lucky. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Thank you, and Madam President, thank you again. Congratulations, Judge Mullins. You are truly distinguished. Our fourth honoree this evening is John Prout. John served as President and Chief Executive Officer of TriHealth from 1998 to 2015. Under his leadership, TriHealth transformed into the region's largest and most comprehensive health care provider by guiding TriHealth through the challenges of health reform while growing the organization. TriHealth earned recognition through Truven as one of the top 15 health systems in the country and also a U.S. News and World Report ranking within America's top 100 hospitals category. Vision. Purpose. Community. John Prout. I've always said that empathy is not an easy thing to fake. And when you get to know John Prout well, you know that he cares about you genuinely. When you think of it and you look at his, you know, where he came from in the healthcare arena, he worked his way up. He's grown up through the industry. He started as a medic in the military and obviously found his passion and was able to just really cultivate his passion. It was more than a career. It was, it was a personal investment in TriHealth, TriHealth patients, the, the healthcare of the community. He has a record of great accomplishment when it comes to healthcare quality and patient safety. We were both Bowling Green graduates, and so automatically we had this kind of natural friendship. Our corporation has had a relationship with TriHealth where he was the president and CEO for a very long period of time. The healthcare industry is not for the faint of heart. It is a very, very turbulent time to be leading in this industry. And John has really been um, spectacular in terms of tackling the problems in a very positive way. He came aboard at a time where, tri where TriHealth was really struggling. All the healthcare systems in the city were really struggling, but he really maneuvered the ship and got us on a course. And now we're the thriving number one healthcare system in the region because of the leadership and the team he put together. The longest serving tenure of a CEO of any major hospital system in our region. And I think that speaks volumes about an industry that has had a lot of change and an awful lot of issues and pretty hard to stay at the helm and be successful, yet John was able to do that. The work that John Prout has offered to his community extends well beyond the people who come to TriHealth for care and it extends well beyond the 12,000 employees of TriHealth. Yeah, he used a phrase one time, he says, good people do great things for good people. And, and I've continued to also use that phrase often because it, it's really true and I think John truly did believe that. I think he probably lives by the golden rule. He's a real believer in culture and talks a lot about values. So he's obviously not only a principled man but a person who really thinks about values and what's important. When I think about John and his record of achievement in the healthcare segment of the economy, I think about his work as patient advocate. So we are working with people who are at their most vulnerable, and I think John, just because he is naturally such an, a people person and has such great empathy, really has done a, a, a great job for all of us in terms of moving the ball down the field on how to care for people. One of my colleagues referred to him as having the best combination between being a really good businessman and a humanitarian. He has always believed in the uh, value of families, and their work-life balance, and I think he's always treated his employees that way, which I'm sure has engendered all of those employees to him. Something that will always be near and dear to my heart was when um, my father was um, struggling at the end of his battle with cancer, and I'll never forget John saying to me, you go and take and do whatever you need to do to be with your family and your father. That's something that will always be near and dear to my heart. And so if you think about a leader, that's, 
you know, leader makes people want to come and, and work for them and, and, and want to do good things for them. And John never came across as, as a boss. He, he always though came across as someone that we wanted to do good things for. So he's very mission and you know, value draw, uh, uh, driven and um, that always helped me, you know, it always helped me in making the right decisions. Over the last, you know, five years, ten years, you can't speak about healthcare in Cincinnati unless you talk about TriHealth and John Prout, and, and those are two names that go together. Congratulations, John. Please join Dr. Maisie on stage to receive your award. Good evening. I'm between you and the end of the evening, I think. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's great to be back at Bowling Green and see, spend time with friends and cheer on the Falcons. It was author Thomas Wolfe who wrote the book, You Can't Go Home Again. Well, Thomas, I'm home and it feels great. I'd like to congratulate the other honorees. Wow, I'm not worthy. Catherine, Michael, and Judge Mullins, all of whom just have such astounding stories, but they all are focused and relate to Bowling Green, and I commend you on representing us and what you've done for your communities and your families. I'd be remiss if I didn't expend my sincere appreciation to President Maisie. Thank you so much. Gotten to know her and uh, through a little sporting events and a few other things, but we've She's doing a wonderful job in Vice President of University Adv Advancement, Shea. Great to get to know you and have dinner with you and share some stories about when you lived in Cincinnati. So um, my career's taken me from my roots in Ohio to Bowling Green to didn't work in Ohio until 20 years ago when I came to Cincinnati. But now that I'm retired, I'll be back to Bowling Green, I can guarantee you. A brief background, because I've been asked tonight, um, you should know my ties to this beautiful campus are deeply rooted. My great uncle, I kept asking my mother, who is he? Oh, he's your grandfather's brother, was Frank Prout, who served for many, many years as president of Bowling Green State University. Prout Chapel was named for him and the former Prout Residence Hall, which was on this footprint as we speak. Uh, was named for him and uh, named in honor of his wife Alice. My great aunt Alice played a big role, heard a lot of stories in the family and at BG about how popular and visible she was on this campus. She was part of the Bowling Green community as much or more so than he was. <laughs> as a high school senior in Columbus, I can vividly remember my father looking at me Kids have such a struggle these days, but my dad looked at me in dinner and in one sentence, John, what state school are you going to? <laughs> it was September 67 and I was an impressionable teenager at Dublin High School and I decided to go to Bowling Green for many reasons. One, strong family connection to the school, going back generations and secondly my oldest sister Peggy had attended the school here and I had a great experience great experience starting in 1958 when I came to visit her as an eight-year-old and her roommate was says uh, so we were in a dorm room my family her roommate her family there were about seven eight of us she says uh, don't leave my boyfriend's coming in well, in walked Nate Thurmond, and there was no room in the... <laughs> there was no more room in that. <laughs> Could barely breathe. Uh, but I'm looking up at Nate Thurmond. And I'm eight years old. It was the greatest day of my life. 
But Bowling Green had an excellent reputation for education and especially business in the county. And those were the things that interested me and I, they were key factors and very important in helping me ultimately decide what path I would take. Mike, I started as a business pre-law major. Dr. Chan Han, you taught me, thank you so much. But Bowling Green was a different place 50 years ago. So much is the same, but it was a little different. Lyndon Johnson was president. Jim Morrison, the doors were singing, light my fire. <laughs> and the Vietnam War protests were taking place on this campus right before my eyes. And I was in the Army Reserves as a medic wearing a real Army jacket. In Cleveland, Carl Stokes was elected the mayor of that city, becoming the first African-American mayor of a major city. The times, they indeed were changing. By coming to Bowling Green, I had the privilege to meet and become friends with a variety of very smart and motivating people. A true melting pot of friends, many of whom I still stay in touch with. The combination of friends who helped me grow as a person and the professors who challenged me intellectually really prepared me for the next phase of my life. When I came to Bowling Green, I was a business pre-law because my parents expected me to be a lawyer. I decided I wanted to do something else with my life. And here at Bowling Green, by the time I graduated, I knew exactly what I wanted to do based on the experiences I had here. And I did it until last December 31st. You've shaped my career, Bowling Green, thank you. As I said, I went into I uh, wanted to go into business, and that's what I majored in, and use what I learned for the good of others. Healthcare was that answer, and Bowling Green put me on that path, and what a credible journey it's been. Along the way, I, carry, uh, I carried many of the concepts and principles I learned while studying business here, including relationships. That's what it's all about in the healthcare business. I speak fondly of my experiences here at Bowling Green. I'm a big advocate. You could tell how emotional it was for me because at times people would ask if recalling those memories made me sad. I'm like, sad? I'd say, no. The truth is, while I missed my friends in the university and pursued my career outside the state, I was never sad to be away. My life here has stayed with me forever. No one can take away the wonderful experiences we have on this campus. Those experiences help shape me to who I am and what I accomplished for myself, our family, and for this university. I'm happy to report that I was able to use what I learned here for the purpose of doing good for others. What I never expected was one day to be recognized by my alma mater. Thank you so much. I'll cherish this evening. Thanks for including me this evening. Congratulations, John. The success of our four honorees are a true testament to their determination and everything that they have achieved. Congratulations, and we are very honored to induct you as four new members into our Academy of Distinguished Alumni. The beauty of this evening is that we have honored four outstanding alumni, but we also want to thank everybody that is here with us this evening for everything that you do for Bowling Green State University and everything that you do to give back to our students. Keep doing great things, and BGSU will be a better place because of it. I would like to acknowledge Joel Odoricio, who is a faculty member who was uh, responsible for making our glass pieces this evening. And you will also see the glass piece design throughout all the decor for this evening. Joel has collections across the nation and he's very impressive. To close out the evening, I would like to invite President Maisie, Dan Mordarski, and our four honorees on stage as we ask you to follow us along in reciting the BGSU Creed. 
you will find Creed cards on your table as well as listed on the screen behind us. Please join us as we read the creed. I am a falcon. I value an education inside and outside of the classroom. I aspire to be an engaged global citizen and leader. I seek service to improve my community. I collaborate with fellow falcons in changing the world. I promote diversity, respect, and a culture of inclusion. I pursue excellence in all I do. I support my Falcon family. I believe in BGSU. I am a Falcon. Thank you all in sharing this fantastic evening with us. We hope to see you throughout the many activities for homecoming weekend and on campus often. Congrats and go Falcons.